Hello, welcome to Rudyard Kipling's house, Batemans, here in uh, Burwash in East Sussex. I'm Mike Kipling, secretary of the Kipling Society and an occasional guide and poetry reader here. And I'm going to be your guide as we go around the house today. We'll speak to one or two of the other volunteers and Kipling Society members in some of the rooms and in some of the other spaces, as well as to one or two National Trust uh, staff members. Uh, but first of all, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the house which you can see behind me. The house itself was built in 1634, according to the date over the door, although uh, some uh, architectural historians suggest there was a house on the site earlier. We don't know who it was built by. It may have been built by one of the local ironmasters. Iron founding being a major industry in this part of the country in the 16th and 17th centuries. Certainly iron masters would have been more likely to have had the sort of money necessary to build a house like Bateman's. Um, since uh, that time it's largely been used as a farmhouse uh, throughout uh, right up until the end of the 19th century at which point it had become rather run down and was occupied by uh, at least two families of farm workers. Uh, in the 1890s it was bought by a um, man from London who decided to uh, do it up as, as his countryside retreat uh, and Rudyard Kipling wanting to find somewhere uh, that was quite remote where the, the large number of people who always wanted to try and catch a, a glimpse of him as he was sort of the JK Rowling of his day uh, found it um, sort of quite a, a, a well, came across it and found it was a lovely place to be because it was, was so remote uh, and because he was an early adapter as we shall see shortly of the motor car it was more accessible to him than it was to most of the to most of his fans so having given you that brief introduction to the house uh, we'll now make our way into the hall as we go into the house i'd just like to draw your attention to these little initials carved on the this archway where rudyard kipling his wife carrie and two of his children uh, carved their uh, initials and also, as we go into the house, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the, the bell pull here. Um, this bell pull uh, was originally at Kipling's uncle's house, uh, Edward Burne Jones's house in Fulham in London, where Kipling used to go when he was a uh, young boy, and it was his refuge away from the uh, cruel step parents he lived with in Southsea. So when he rang this bell, he knew that he was in for a, a month of, of, uh, of uh, having a, a fun time every Christmas. And so when the house at, at, in Fulham was being demolished, he asked if he could have the bell so that any children coming here to Batemans would ring it. Uh, they would know that, uh, that they were welcome in the house as well. Ah, oh, hello and welcome to Batemans. As I'm sure most of you know, uh, Batemans was acquired in 1902 by the Kiplings. The attraction being, of course, that the house was delightful. It was large, but not enormous. And with the house, they purchased the surrounding land uh, and ended up with some 330 acres of land which gave them the privacy which was totally impossible in Rottingdean. So that's good. On the downside the house had been tenanted for several many years uh, and uh, when they took over the house it was unfurnished. Virtually no furniture, also no, no electricity, uh, no creature comforts, no heating apart from the open fires and uh, uh, the water uh, was in pretty short supply as well. So they were faced with having an enormous expenditure really to make the house habitable. Now one of the first things that they did, and I always wondered whether this was at the instigation of Carrie, is they actually put in central heating. And that is really, this is really one of the first houses to actually use central heating. They were no longer reliant completely upon the open fires, and apparently during the winter, 
before the central heating and I suspect after the uh, the fire here was sort of burning 24 hours a day then they had to make up their mind how they were going to furnish it well it had to be period furniture they decided that so they then spent the next 30 40 years really acquiring suitable suitable Jacobean 17th century furniture and what you see in the room and indeed in the house is furniture largely Jacobean and uh, uh, Indian objects really based upon Kipling's time in India. Uh, he spent the first five years of his life and then seven years uh, from the age of 17 to 24 when he of course he was the sub-editor of the English language newspaper in Lahore and as such accumulated a lot of artifacts and if you look around you will see uh, numerous obviously Indian artifacts. The obvious objects are the large Jacobean items such as you know, the main uh, table, chairs and uh, benches. Now it was virtually impossible to get absolutely genuine unrestored furniture and so most of these Jacobean objects uh, have indeed been restored. I mean for example this rather magnificent Jacobean table actually has a Victorian top. The other items well you've got there a Mortlake tapestry 17th century and so many of the things they had were bought perhaps because they were in period rather than they being, being particularly useful. Now, there are several objects here which are really interesting and indeed magnificent in their own right. Now, the first one is the watercolours on the wall. Now, Kipling had, first of all, Sir Edward Burne Jones as an uncle. He also had Sir Edward Pointer and Sir Edward Pointer was president of the Royal Academy and uh, he produced these two watercolours of the house in 1913. They're signed and dated and they are I think magnificent. We have a watercolour there now that actually is of Burne Jones's house uh, in Fulham, the Grange, and that was painted uh, by his uh, by his main studio assistant. Two mirrors here, one here, the other one on the other wall, uh, and these are rather interesting because one. This one is uh, convex, which means it's a fisheye lens. And it was always known as a chaperone mirror because in earlier, more squeamish times, obviously um, an unmarried a girl and a man couldn't possibly be together. I mean, the mar I can't imagine uh, what could have possibly happened, but. Uh, the Victorians could, uh, and so you had to have a chaperone by convention. So she had to sit there like a lemon. Well, you know, the two people sat there and made polite conversation. Now, with a chaperone mirror, of course, with a wider angle of view, the chaperone didn't even have to be there. You had to have a chaperone, but it doesn't, doesn't follow that it needed to be immediately in the room. Chaperone mirror. The other mirror, concave. Now this time you will notice two candles and this is really a concave converging mirror. You light the candles, it concentrates the light because of course in the 17th century lighting was by candles, very expensive, uh, tapers, oil lamps. 
So this was a, a way of really magnifying you know, the light at no extra charge. Right. Now, perhaps lastly, one of the sort of glories of the house is the clock. These clocks are called lantern clocks, I suppose, for the obvious reason it looked like a lantern. But in actual fact, the name probably comes from the fact that the case is made of a brass alloy called lanteen. So that probably gave the name rather than the shape. This clock, if you look at it, uh, the maker's name, Daniel Hoskin, is actually engraved on the silver ring. It's called the chapter ring, and it actually has his signature and, I believe, the date. And it was made then in about 16, let's say 1630. I think uh, it's a very accurate clock. Works very well. The only slight problem is that the weight it's a 30-hour clock, so the weights are lifted each day, and at the end of the day, it's gone through the cycle, lift them again. So they do need to be regulated sort of every, uh, every 24 hours. One other thing about the clock, and that is it was usual to put the owner's name uh, in the top plate. Now, you can see it's the royal crest, no significance because most of the clocks had the royal crest uh, and the owner's initials on the shield in the middle and in fact it does say RK, right? So that must have been put on after the Kiplings bought the clock uh, in, the, in the 1920s. Certainly wasn't there when it was made in 1630. Well, David, thank you very much for, for telling me all about the hall. Not at all. And uh, now I'll uh, take the, uh, the viewers through to the parlour. Come this way. Hello, we're now in Rudyard Kipling's parlour, and uh, there are a few things in here that, that uh, is, well, I'd like to draw your attention to. Perhaps, first of all, we'll look at some of the uh, cabinets here, which, which there are a couple, and they're really full of a whole series of objects Kipling collected or had, had given to him throughout his life. Uh, quite a lot of them have, as David was saying in the, uh, in the hall, had an Indian, have an Indian connection. Others include uh, bits of, uh, of porcelain ware and, and so on. Now this was a room in which Kipling and his family used to relax. Perhaps after dinner they'd come in here and you can always imagine in, in a in a, in a sort of winter that they're sitting down here in front of a, a roaring fire on this, uh, on this knoll sofa, uh, which would have kept the, the, the draughts out of their backs quite nicely. It's said that uh, Kipling would often be found on his hands and knees on the floor playing with his, his Ab Black Aberdeen Terrier dogs, which he had a, a succession of at the times they lived here in Batemans, and of course wrote a number of dog stories about them. On the wall is an embroidery of an orange tree thought to have been designed by May Morris, one of the daughters of William Morris. It was used by the Kiplings as a door hanging and has recently been restored. One picture I particularly like to draw your attention to on the wall over here is a cartoon by uh, Burne Jones, as David said, Kip one of Kipling's uncles. And this is a portrait of Kipling's three children. Sent at Christmas 1897, Josephine is on the left, young John in the middle, and Elsie on the right. Immediately underneath it is, is a phonograph, an original Edison phonograph. Uh, it isn't something that was here in Batemans, unlike many of the other items we've been looking at, but it is the sort of thing that Rudyard Kipling was quite likely to have had, if only to listen perhaps to some of the phonographs of some of his own poems set to music, such as the Road to Mandalay. Now I'm going to, as I often do to visitors, demonstrate this and how it works. I just have to go around to this side, wind it up a little bit, turn it on and set it playing.
Now, I don't know if you were able to hear that or not, but it was playing Kipling's Smuggler's Song. Um, it, now, if you didn't like the noise coming out of the phonograph, you could always literally put a sock in it. And this is an example of the sort of sock that uh, Carrie and Elsie might have been knitting for, for John when he was away uh, fighting in the First World War in 1915. Right, so we'll uh, move on from the parlour now and go out into the inner hallway. I just want to point out one or two things in there before we then go up the stairs to Kipling's study. And on the wall here we have three uh, plaques by Kipling's father, Lockwood, uh, which were used as illustrations in The Jungle Book and Kim. And if we look particularly at this one, we can see the well-known characters of Mowgli, Baloo the Bear and the Wolves. Also, just round in the corner here is a bust of Rudyard Kipling himself. And then we'll go up the uh, main stairs of the house uh, and uh, into what's probably the powerhouse of the, the building, Rudyard Kipling's study. Just before we go in, it's probably worth looking at a number, some of the portraits of Kipling that are displayed around the inner uh, landing here. So this is, is Rudyard Kipling's study. The first thing I think I want to talk about is the desk, where we can see that it's, it's rather cluttered. And that was exactly how Kipling had it when he, he worked. It's full of books, uh, some maps perhaps to uh, plan his next motoring journey. And what you notice on the floor is a waste paper basket absolutely full of scrap paper. And Kipling, of course, was meticulous in, in drafting and redrafting, but that basket paper would have gone on to the, one of the fires in the house in winter or into a fire in the garden at the end of each day because he didn't want to leave any working papers behind or, or just put them in the, the normal rubbish in case journalists or others uh, came round uh, seeking to get advance notice of what he was working on. Above the fireplace we've got a picture of Rudyard Kipling's wife Caroline and showing her I think as uh, very much the, the sort of mistress of the house with uh, her keys around her waist. Also on the wall here is a picture that I'd like to draw attention to. It, it doesn't look very much as a picture of a lake, but that is actually Rudyard Lake in Staffordshire, after which Rudyard Kipling got his, uh, got his middle name, which was, as I'm sure most of you know, where his, uh, his mother and father went for a picnic uh, and suddenly discovered that they had a lot in common. On the wall over here, we've got uh, a plan that Rudyard Kipling drew up of what he wanted his garden to look like. And after we've been around the house, we're going to go out into the garden and you'll be able to see how, uh, how that design with the pond and the rose garden beyond it were actually made to, to come true uh, not that long after he drew up those plans. Now, on the, on the wall, over here we have, uh, we have a collection of books. Uh, there are over 2,000 books in the room and they are pretty much in the uh, same order that they were left when Rudyard Kipling left the house the final time. And it really do repay his study as the sorts of things that he was, he was interested in. So we have a lot of, of books about history and geography, history of India, books written by various explorers. And then 
over here we have the collected works of uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, who was, of course, one of Kipling's uh, favourite authors and whom he, Kipling nearly managed to get to visit uh, in Samoa, got as far as New Zealand, but then uh, the only ship going to Samoa was uh, captained by some, uh, a sailor who was a notorious drunkard and Kipling decided in the end not to, not to take that journey. So he never did get to meet his, his hero, Stevenson. Up at the top here, we've got um, a little clay portrait uh, of Kipling's father, uh, Lockwood, smoking a pipe. And that was actually the, the model for Lockwood Kipling's own book plate. Uh, and two pictures along there. In fact, in the middle, we have Kipling's uncle, Burne Jones. And the next one along is, in fact, Roger Kipling's own book plate designed by his father. That, I think, is most of the main things in the study. And now we'll just go through into the exhibition room where John Walker will uh, show us some of the key items kept here at Bateman's. Hello, John. Oh, Good to see you. Welcome to the Wonder House. give you such a brief tour here that some of you will run screaming. This is such a splendid exhibition. But I, as the Kipling Society librarian, I'm going to lead us first to a book. I'm going to take us over to look at Quartet from 1885. Kipling himself, his sister Trix and his mother and father produced something which was very special, but so rare now that I come here sometimes just to look at it. And when I'm here looking at that, I have a chance to look at the 1888 set of the railway edition, which some of you as Kipling enthusiasts may have in your own collections. And some of you who are just coming to the subject may want to know a little more about Kipling was selling through the uh, publishers that he was already dealing with a series of six paperback books which could be sold on railway platforms and at the time they did very very well indeed and of course as those of you who have covered the subject will know that was the beginning of his fame in this country too. You'll see that these six are special in that they do not have the English price on them. They're genuine, original railway library copies. Now, where to take you next? Well, I'm going to ask the camera if it can pan across to look at the illustrations which Kipling's father Lockwood did for the Jungle Book and some of his other work. And if you're coming into Bateman's, this will be one of the reasons, certainly, that you'll want to spend time here studying this fascinating new way of illustrating a great author's work. I want to lead you to a copy of the Jungle Book itself, which is special because it has the illustrations by the two Detmold brothers in it. And here, near where we're standing, is a small room in which there are the original illustrations. Now I call this a treasure house and I'm going to move on next to some of the minor family treasures. And over here, something that again I come to see whenever I visit Bateman's. Reading Kipling's writing about himself, you may remember that his story of Bateman's in the, uh, we won't call it an autobiography, but in something of myself, was mention of the finding of clay pipes and a spoon. And here, in what seems almost like a family treasures exhibition section, there are the genuine original clay pipes and spoon. 
and many, many other things. I really need to spend far more time with you on that. But I'm now going to ask the camera to turn around again, sideways here, because we're on to the subject of Bateman's itself. And here we have the visitor's book. And I'm going to draw our attention to just one thing. It says for 1920, and it has August the 4th, Mother FIP, about 6.30 p.m. And some of us know what that means, but we will explain nonetheless for you. FIP, fell in pond. Uh, some famous people did that too. And how can we leave this august place without making our way across to the central display and reminding you that the very first English writer to receive the, the Nobel Prize in Literature was Kipling and he is still the youngest to have done so. So we have an exhibition piece here which shows the declaration for the actual presentation and let me warn anybody who goes off as I did to find the place in Sweden where this presentation actually took place that the uh, central hall where Nobel Prizes are now handed out wasn't built in 1907 when Kipling actually received his and so we had to scuttle around and find a hotel, the very hotel where Kipling had received it. Something so special to anyone who is aware of this man as an international writer. I've done this display great harm by skipping from one place to another. There is so much here that you could spend a day just looking at the exhibition centre. So I will lead you on to the next room and I'm taking you through to another bedroom because this of course was the original master bedroom of the house. But if you came to Bateman's in the 70s as I used to, you will remember this room set up, I think that's the right way to describe it, as Rudyard and Carrie's own room with um, a precious handmade coverlet on the bed. It has now been changed in its character, perhaps back to something that was much more important for it. Certainly Rudyard and Carrie, we think, did use this room as a bedroom, but it's now officially John's room. And that's something very special to me. For uh, several years I used to come to Bateman's and do lecture lunches at about the time of Armistice Day on John Kipling. And I felt very strongly that there should be as much good information out there about this brave young man as possible. So this is a very suitable room to remember him. Notice that I'm not saying that Kipling actually had it as a shrine, certainly not, but I would like to draw your attention to some of the things that are directly relevant to John's life. And perhaps a touch falsely, we have some uniforms from St Albans Prep School in Rottingdean. Now, these may not actually be quite authentic, but when St Albans closed, we were glad to receive some items which were suitable to reflect on John's early life in Rottingdean and moving on to Batemans here and the way he travelled to and fro to prep school. It gives us a chance to reflect on John, the, the sportsman. John was a good runner and a good cricketer. And we have some boots as well and a hockey stick and various other things to be explained to the children of visitors here today. And we also have 
some reflection of John as a schoolboy reader. And so I see that currently we have Yarns of the South Sea Pioneers by Basil Matthews, which most of us won't have read, but reflective of John's own time here. If I were touring with someone through this room, I would certainly draw their attention to the spectacles. John, of course, was very short-sighted and his story, as told well or badly on TV and on the stage, certainly has that as a key point. In my talks about John, one of my points, and you may feel a very minor one, was to establish that John was never called Jack. It's very clear there that we have a problem because so many people, because of the internet, are of the opinion that he must be called Jack because Kipling wrote a poem called My Boy Jack. But in fact, I make clear, and I hope you are clear, that that Jack was a young lad called Jack Cornwell, who at the age of 16 died at the Battle of Jutland. And that leads us on to the difficult question of John's own army career. And so one of the very important aspects of this room is certainly John's own war medals from the First War. They were originally kept by his sister Elsie and taken off to her home in Cambridgeshire, but they're now here and people can reflect on the life of a young lad who at the age of 18 was to go off to war and just a few short weeks later was to die. This would be a good point at which to point out this portrait of Josephine, Kipling's oldest daughter, who of course was to die in 1899 and we remember that the grief that went with that death in New York uh, may have led Kipling to need to come here to Batemans. And maybe we should we should just reflect for a moment too using that word over and over again, because this room is a reflection for me on the fact that Rudyard managed to weather those storms and carry on to change, perhaps, as Elsie suggested, never to be able to write quite in the same way again, but to survive, to in the words of his own poem, perhaps to never breathe a word about the loss. Well, John, thank you very much. That's the most interesting expose of the exhibition room and uh, John's room. Thank you very much. And now uh, we're going to go down the back stairs and into the dining room. Right, so this is the final room that we're going to visit in the house, which is the dining room, uh, where the Kipling family would have had all their formal dinners, uh, and particularly Rudyard and Carrie would have entertained guests. Now, one thing that you can, you can see is that the, the table here is, is quite small. It's not opened out now, but in fact, uh, you know, there are only um, eight chairs, formal chairs for the room, uh, and that was the, the sort of groups that Kipling liked to have to entertain. He wasn't a didn't want like didn't throw big dinner parties for 40 people he just liked to have a few very close friends with whom he could have uh, interesting conversations and as john has shown you the visitors book upstairs you know there are all sorts of people from from his cousin stanley baldwin the prime minister to, to sort of senior um, military officials and, and others with and, and other literary and literary figures such as as uh, his great friend Ryder haggard now the most interesting thing about the dining room is what is actually
covering the walls because unlike the rest of the house which is uh, covered with, with oak panels this is actually uh, um, covered with painted leather it's not original to the house but does date from the mid 18th century uh, and it's what they call Cordoba style leather where the, the leather is first of all um, given a, a coating, a metallic coating uh, in this case uh, um, and then it, it's painted, the, the pictures are painted on with, with oil paints uh, and we now know that these, the um, coverings in this room actually came from, uh, uh, from Holland uh, and were brought to the UK by a Dutch man who was uh, in the early 1900s living at Limington in Hampshire and there's a record of Kipling driving over there or being driven over there in his car uh, and coming back with rolls and rolls of, of this uh, to, to cover most of the walls of, of the dining room. One thing that I, I want to just draw your attention to is this little, there's a little cubby hole here in the wall. And it's not quite known what it is for. Um, some people suggest it might be for keeping bottles of wine cool. Um, others say more, more rather less politely that it was where a chamber pot was kept. So when the gentlemen were smoking and drinking in the room, they didn't have to go very far to uh, relieve themselves. But I'm told that, that uh, Kipling's children used to leave little messages in there for, for their father. And when he came home, he'd open it up and see if there were any there and leave some in return, which is a, a rather nice use of it. The final thing in, in this room I'd just like to point out is the stove. And you can see that the, the fireplace here is much smaller than in many other, of the other rooms. And in fact, behind this, there is, is a big uh, fireplace, uh, as we saw in, in the hall. And, uh, but when Kipling came, he had this uh, modern smokeless stove fitted, which was really the height of technology in sort of the 1900s. Uh, and it was driven by powdered uh, coal, which was put in the, through the top and that, that came down and burnt as necessary and because it was, was fitted to the chimney piece no smoke came out into the room which made it ideal to, to have in, in the dining room and because he only needed a small fireplace he also had the, uh, these Dutch tiles uh, put, put there to uh, just make it that little bit of an extra decorative feature. So having covered the house we're now going to go out uh, into the grounds and we'll meet John Walker again uh, at the garage and he'll show us and tell us all about uh, the Rolls, Kipling's Rolls Royce that's kept there. Here I am now on the way to the garage to see John Walker. I have to introduce you to 20AL. Many of you will know that vintage Rolls Royces are not identified by the registration number as they may have many lives. And indeed Kipling's 20AL was not as it is now. What we have here is a 1928 New Phantom and Kipling bought it in 1928. So a fairly new model of car and he found a faster, more exciting car than the previous Rolls Royces that he had owned. Many of you will know also that Kipling had several Rolls Royces altogether and several of those have stories of their own which reflect on that fact about the registration number and the chassis number. For example, one of the earliest Rolls Royces that he had probably ended its life in the First War as an armoured car. And another went on to become a hand-drawn uh, chariot for a god in Bombay. And a third? Well, a third is actually for sale currently, but has been completely rebodied into something which Kipling would not only not recognise, but never dream of driving in. But if you wish to know more, then keep an eye open for Kipling's Rolls-Royce labelled the Duchess. Now this car was also called the Duchess, but this one 
the fourth Duchess of Tours. And the bodywork that we have behind me is wrong. No, not wrong in the sense of wrong for a, a Rolls Royce. This is a Windover saloon. But Kipling had a limousine landaulet body on this produced by Hoopers. So from 1899, with those first adventures with the embryo, and then in 1901, when the locomobile was something that coloured his experience of Batemans here, it's clear that his experience of cars generally is something that's much deeper than many of us would uh, understand. Maybe I do. Kipling writes so well about motoring generally that it's easy to forget that he never officially drove a car himself. And indeed, one of the major differences between this body on 20AL and the body that originally was built for Kipling by Hoopers was that the chauffeur drove an open space, no side windows. Indeed, this was almost the last Rolls and they had to persuade Kipling that the next one should have a closed body. He felt that the chauffeur should be out in the open air. He had one more after this, bought in 1932, and it seems likely that this car was sold on finally either in 1932 or maybe on in 1936. There seemed to be two stories to this. And this car then went on to be owned by a succession of people, the uh, last of which was Jack Hayward. So Jack decided that having restored the car, he would present it to the National Trust. He did that in 1982, and the car has been here since then. So again, if you're a motoring enthusiast, perhaps a Kipling man or woman yourself, you'll know that 40 years is not awfully good for a car to be standing still. It's been well looked after by the National Trust, but it should soon, we hope, be given the chance to move again. Thank you, John. And now we'll go to the garden to meet David Forsyth again. This is uh, Len, uh, our head gardener. Um, and I'm going to ask Len really to explain uh, the associations that the garden still has with Kipling and uh, perhaps what are his plans also for the future development. Okay, so it's lovely to be able to uh, show everyone around the garden. Um, where we are now in the orchard is probably the least authentic, if you like, of uh, the areas that Kipling created uh, through his time living here. Um, but we are stood here next to Pear Alley, and Pear Alley is one of the original features um, in the orchard. It used to be uh, adorned with pears, it used to be covered with pears during Kipling's time. It then, uh, most of the trees failed, they were replaced, um, but more recently they started failing again, so this is one area we want to restore. As much as possible we want to get the garden to look as close to it the way it did during Kipling's time as possible. Um, our intention is always to garden with Kipling in mind. Now I do remember when I first came here, and that was about five years ago, there was a tree that was, even to me, manifestly an X tree, uh, and I was told that that was the last tree that Kipling had planted. And I remember feeling rather sad that this was the end of a link with the past, but I gather that's not quite so. That's right. So uh, you know, we were always sort of planning for the future with gardens. Um, so what we did when we knew that this uh, last Kipling tree was about to fail, we took some cuttings from it um, and we grew them onto uh, new rootstocks. Um, so we have a living example of that tree still existing in the orchard. It is right at the top, um, but it is a beauty of bath tree that would have existed during Kipling's time and we've kept it going through to this day. Oh, that's, well, that's good news. It's good news. Yes, I mean, yeah, it, it's the continuity, I think, which is perhaps so important here. I mean, we're looking back 1902, you know, 
and yet we still have links with that time. We do, we do. And the nice thing about the garden itself is that it's growing and it's developing all the time. Gardens aren't static things, you know, they keep developing and Kipling himself had that in mind when he started mm. planting the garden. It evolved during the time that he was here and we're continuing that sort of ethos of gardening with, I suppose, what you call a relaxed formality. That was one of the key things that visitors to the garden found when they visited during Kipling's time. It was very ordered, but also relaxed at the same time. So you could have juxtapositions of mm. formality like the pear alley next to a more loose planting of orchard trees and indeed the vegetables as well. So that, as you walk through the garden, you get little snippets mm. of that all the way through. It, it was all about creating a space that the family could enjoy and their friends and uh, other sort of family members could enjoy as well. And that was one of the things mm. that you really get a sense of even today, the way we try and encourage visitors to enjoy the place. Um, it's not a, a formal garden in the sense mm. that you have to be quiet. You know, the children would have run around, they would have enjoyed themselves. And you can see that more mm. when we go into uh, the other area of the garden. Mm. But that was it. So it was a case of you know controlling things under the surface, but then allowing everyone else to express themselves and enjoy themselves. Mm. Yes. And we're walking now into uh, what we now call the Mulberry Garden. Um, but during Kipling's time, it was called the Kitchen Garden. If you were Kipling, walking in here now, mm -hmm. what would he have seen? It's not quite as it was during Kipling's time, but bear in mind that when Kipling arrived, it was t different as well. So um, before Kipling, uh, the house for many years was a farmhouse, um, and this would have been the farmyard, the centre of the farm. Uh, the buildings, which are now our tea room, in fact, um, were open sheds where they kept carts and things like that. Mm. And what he did, he created probably the most formal area of the garden right here. Um, so the lawns that are now uh, turfed over uh, would have been part of this grand scheme of box uh, hedge lined borders. Mm -hmm. uh, the fruit trees would have been here. Um, that was again one of those strange juxtapositions of ornamental planting with productive planting alongside it. Um, there is also a suggestion that there would have been uh, fruit trees grown on the wall. Mm -hmm. But most of the That's pictures funny. that we do have of this garden, it's very ornamental. Um, and what we've tried to do over the, the years when the Trust first opened the garden, we had to reduce the amount of uh, planting there was, uh, less staff, oh, no yeah, volunteers. Oh, oh. Um, but now what we're doing is trying to bring back more of that ornamental planting. Mm. At the moment it is just annuals, um, so we can change the scheme every year, keep it fresh. Um, give people a bit of a wow factor in what mm. is one of the uh, busiest parts of the oh, garden. Absolutely, yeah. Well, it uh, always is every year. Incredible. Yeah. But we do have a grand plan. Um, it's going to take probably two or three years. We need to do some fundraising to do this as well. But we have uh, the intention as part of our garden management plan to return this garden very much to the way it was during Kipling's mm. time. So that's recreating mm. borders in the centre as well as to the edges and bringing back much more of those types of plants that Kipling would have grown here. Yeah, I mean, compared to the plants that were available to Kipling, mm -hmm. presumably the variety you have available now, particularly for the annuals, mm. must be much greater. It is, it is a lot different. Um, and cultivars have sort of developed over years that become more resistant to diseases, mm. thrive better in a changing climate, if you like. Um, but we can still keep true to Kipling's ethos by looking at the sort of plants that he did grow mm -hmm. and finding sort of complementary cultivars that more modern plants that we know will thrive. Um, but an interesting point about uh, Kipling's garden is that he did occasionally have plants sent over from different parts of the world. So it's something that we're interested in connecting mm. Kipling with the, the places around the world that he knew, you know, oh. North America, possibly Japan, South Africa, places like that. Brazil, so, of course. Well, yes, you know, so it gives mm. us quite a broad palette to work with and a whole range of plants that we can bring back into the garden. Yes, Len, I mean, one thing that has always appealed to me is this avenue of pleat life. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that this, uh, this avenue was here before Kipling. 
Yes, we do. But he must no. have maintained it, uh, and a great deal of work required too. Uh, and you carry on the great tradition. Yeah, we try our best to uh, keep uh, what is a, another significant part of the garden mm. going. Um, we do know that it was planted in 1898, so four years oh, before oh, the Kiplings arrived. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have a photograph of the framework that was created to do the initial training of them, and that was put up during Kipling's time. Oh. Um, so they would have been oh, very formal if you like, sort of oh. like a hedge on stilts, if you like, is a sort of layman's way of looking at it. Um, they were unfortunately neglected during the uh, Second World War. Um, so now the way we maintain them is a slightly larger, broader structure than they originally would have been. Mm. Um, but every year we uh, meticulously uh, prune them out to one bud all the way across in the middle of winter when it's really cold, mm. but it, it's a labour of love, um, and we do well, it every year. Well, there are only volunteers, then. I mean, doesn't, <laughs> you can lose 10%. Oh, no, this is very much a technical staff job, I'm this sure one. I have to ask you about the lily pond. Mm -hmm. It is received wisdom uh, that this was funded uh, from Kipling's Nobel Prize in 1907, I think the prize was some £7,600. Mm. Uh, and certainly I have been uh, uh, very happy to tell the visitors that is what the prize was and that is where it went. I think you may not be quite so sure. Well, I, you know, I, it's not a definite statement of fact, maybe. Um, but we do know mm. that Kipling actually designed this garden, so the lily pond and the mm. rose garden together. That's right. um, and we have that original sketch um, in well, the house. It's in the study. Yeah, that's it's it. Um, and Nobel that was done in 1906, before he was awarded the Nobel Prize. So he was going to create the garden regardless of whether he won any money or not. Well, you say so, that, but it, it might have been an ambition, a dream, mm. if I ever get the money. I Dear think, me, I think he from was the well King. off. <laughs> yes. <No. laughs> I think he was certainly uh, sort of uh, wealthy enough to have been able to afford that anyway. But it is a nice connection that, you know, he did, you know, at the time that he was planning to create this garden, he was awarded the Nobel Prize and that sum of money, so quite likely that he would have used some of that money to create the garden, so I think that's a very good sort of connection. Well, he probably used as much as the money as Carrie would allow. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh. yeah, and I, you know, I find oh, the, you know, the actual pond with the lilies and the the background there of the roses, mm -hmm. absolutely delightful. Um, it's it's glorious. Were the roses here in Kipling's time or no. a modern addition? No, um, so what was here when Kipling arrived was a pond. Um, it wasn't well, there quite, was a pond there was a pond oh. here, but not quite as you see it. it mm -hmm. So he uh, changed the uh, size of it um, and sort of remodelled it Shaped to be able it, to be a mirror image of you know, the, the uh, width of the rose bed. So the roses were planted um, during Kipling's time. Oh there are, if you look at the drawing um, in, in the, the study, study yeah. uh, you know, there are some elements of his design that never got created. Mm. Um, so there was meant to be a border of yellow roses mm. along the outside that never got planted. Um, but the roses that are here today are um, French and Betty Pryor and Valentine Hart. Um, and two of those three are still the original uh, cultivars of rose. Um, right. The light pink uh, Valentine Hart is actually a replacement for Mrs. Inga Paulson, which was the original light pink, um, but no longer grown in great quantity yeah. in this country. But we are very much, you know, as you see it now, you will, you know, Kipling would have, would recognised, have recognised it. it. Absolutely, yeah. you know, oh, that is how he you. would have uh, envisaged it being. Right. Right. And just one very last question to finish off, and that is the. Um, uh, the relationship between Orida Haggard mm. and the Kiplings. Because uh, I think it's fair to say that both Kiplings regarded Orida Haggard as a sort of a guru. And I would say that he was one of the, uh, you know, one of the first of the ecologists. Because his agricultural policies were very much based on nature, mm -hmm. doing the minimum amount of uh, t 
technical work mm. uh, and uh, I know that the Kiplings supported him strongly and were really devastated of course when he died. Yeah. Now what do you think was the influence of Rider Haggard? I think there's definitely an influence there. I mm. mean we do know that uh, Rider Haggard was one of the few people that Kipling mm. entrusted to be in the study when he was mm. writing. Absolutely. Um, and something that I didn't know until I arrived at Bateman's that uh, um, Rider Haggard was also a bit of a dab hand at garden design. So it's more than likely that he would have had an influence on Kipling, who knew what he liked, but didn't have the technical yeah. nails to be able to create yeah. it. So I think there was a nice relationship yeah. between the two. Yeah. Um, we do feel, uh, the more we look at the garden, that it's got elements of almost arts and crafts um, mm -hmm. within it, mm -hmm. the way it's laid out, um, some of the use of natural materials. Um, you know, there are pictures of the roses being grown up, little wooden hazel sticks and things like that. Um, which for a formal garden is quite sort of like, you know, out of, you know but nonetheless, there's that arts mm. and crafts. Um, there's also a bit of a romantic sort of feel to the garden. As much as it was very much set in its period, um, the layout especially, but the planting within it, as much as we can see from the photographs, was much more of a romantic style and that probably fitted much mm. more with Kipling and we hope, you know, probably the influences of uh, Ryder Haggard as yeah. well in that more naturalistic yeah. way of planting. So, the, I mean, you think there's no doubt that he did have a big influence? Um, I think it would be more than likely yeah. that he did, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, th this is very much, you know, the Kipling family garden. It was theirs to be used, to be enjoyed, um, and it has a beautiful connection with the landscape which Kipling mm. wrote about, um, mm. and you can see, you know, in his mm. books. Um, and that was something that he wanted his children to do, be able to go out, to be able to explore um, and feel that freedom, uh, which is what we hope people feel when they come and visit mm. us today. Oh, I'm sure they do. Well, that was the glory of the garden, thanks to David and Len. That really does bring us to the end of our tour around Batemans tonight. I hope you've enjoyed watching it and um, we, we hope to see you at future meetings of the Kipling Society. Goodbye. <laughs>